Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for uh, joining uh, us today. Uh, I'm so very excited <laughs> about uh, Lorraine Elaine uh, joining us today. Uh, her talk and reading is a part of our Poetry Month uh, events here in the library and in Library Technology Services. Um, it, we had a few uh, events this year, and uh, obviously, it's a bit of an unusual year uh, for known reasons. Uh, so uh, I wanted to name just a Poetry for Justice uh, Poetry Slam event that we had last week. Um, and we had, that was a community run, uh, community activists, uh, poets uh, reading uh, their uh, work. Uh, to our community. Uh, we have a Poetry in the Pocket Day uh, tomorrow. So if we're, uh, you are following our Instagram, you can just deposit your poem and uh, tag us, and it's going to be available on our Instagram site, uh, the libraries. Uh, and uh, also, we have uh, Lauren Elaine uh, <laughs> joining us uh, today. And uh, Lauren is a good friend of mine. Uh, we know each other. Uh, for, I know, I don't want to say how many years, but a few years. Uh, and uh, I think we've met in a, a dance in improvisations class uh, a while ago, uh, while we were at Cornell. Uh, and uh, we both like to travel. And uh, we, we uh, even met in Manchester a few years ago, somehow. <laughs> so, uh, but today, uh, we are very fortunate that Lauren uh, was, uh, all right, uh, and happy to join us. Uh, I think that uh, she has so many different things happening this month, uh, and uh, I'm so happy and excited to bring uh, her, uh, hosted by the Friends of the Leah Libraries uh, board, uh, the group that supports many of the events uh, that we run throughout the year. Uh, so uh, a little bit of an introduction. Uh, so my name is Bosna Davmanes. I'm the university librarian. If you have not met me before, welcome <laughs> and hello. Uh, and uh, uh, Lorraine Elaine, so I'm gonna read uh, the bio. Uh, Lorraine Elaine hails from the twin island nation of Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, her fiction, poetry and nonfiction have been widely published in journals and anthologies, including The Atlantic, Mrs. Muse, Women's Studies Quarterly, Interviewing the Caribbean, Crab Orchard Review, among many others. She's the author of Difficult Fruit. <laughs> and uh, um, uh, but in 2014, and Honeyfish, that we're gonna be listening to, I think today, um, uh, in 2019. Uh, her work has been awarded many honors, most recently the Philip Freund uh, Alumni Prize for Excellence in Publishing from Cornell uh, in 2017, the Green Rose Prize from New Issues Press in 2017, the Split This Rock Poetry Prize in 2016, the Picador Guest Professorship in Literature at the University of Leipzig, Germany in 2015, and an Iowa, uh, Iowa Arts Council Fellowship in 2014. In 2015, the journal Ithaca Lit named her, uh, its annual prize the Lauren K. Elaine Difficult Fruit Poetry Prize. So beyond all those things, uh, Elaine resides in Virginia, uh, where she is the professor of English, uh, and a newly uh, a new title, congratulations, <laughs> uh, at James Madison University and the assistant director of the Furious Flower Poetry Center and editor-in-chief of the, the Fight and the Fiddle. So uh, I, I'm gonna ask a, a, a few questions, I think, after the reading. Uh, I'm interested about the Furious Flower Poetry Center and the work around it. Uh, but uh, I think uh, at this point, uh, it's all yours, Lauren. Um, thank you. It's not a Zoom meeting until somebody's been talking on mute, right? Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm so happy for us to be meeting this way. It's a far cry from improvisational dance as graduate students. I'm glad you brought that up because I was like, I'm still going to tell them uh, how we met. Um, and I'm just really uh, excited to be here today to give this reading um, for the library. So again, thank you for having me. Um, 
Uh, as you mentioned, I was recently um, promoted to full professor at James Madison University, um, where I teach and I also uh, am co uh, I'm assistant director of the Pierce Flower Poetry Center. And so I find myself very much today in a space of gratitude, <laughs> right? Just, um, you know, again, thinking of grad school all the way, it's been, it's been a wonderful journey uh, and a challenging journey in some ways. And um, as you mentioned, I'm also from Trinidad and Tobago. So um, this is very much an immigrant success story. Um, you know, and uh, I, I love to have, um, as a reader, uh, I, I don't usually plan too much in advance what I'm going to read. I sort of let the moment, the occasion, the conversation guide where I start and where we go. And so that sort of was on my mind. So just in the moments before, I thought I would start with this poem from Honeyfish. I'm going to read mostly from Honeyfish. Um, and it's a villanelle, which is a poetic form that has repeated lines so you'll hear a repetition in there um, and this is a visa villanelle first the gathering of proof your life's story reduced to a paper jam of required documents evidence of the right shape of your history surrender every expectation of privacy release the statements Provide your fingerprints, prove you have nothing to hide, your life's story unremarkable in its mundane trajectory of dream, desire, struggle, overcoming, testament to the harmless shape of your history. Leave home at midnight, drive through the wee hours to arrive at the embassy door first with your gathered proof, your rehearsed story. Stand in the chilled street lit dark, Pray the rosary. Repeat again and again to still your heavy beating heart. You have the evidence, all the right forms. This is but a footnote in your history. Dawn. Sunlight opens the day like a key. Wipe the weary from your eyes. Enter. State your intent. Offer the proof of your life. Tell its story. Provide evidence. Give it the shape that will become your history. Um, the next one I'm going to read is still kind of focusing on immigration, um, which is such an acute topic here in the United States. And um, one of the things I feel like I always encounter as somebody who has traveled quite a bit is the difference in experience between folks coming from the you know third world developing whatever euphemism you want to use for underdeveloped and uh, formerly colonized countries um, and those coming from you know the big cities from Europe from Asia you know just it's just such a different experience and I, I thought of the border as a space where um, that could I could explore that a little bit in this poem. So this one is called On the Bridge of a Border Between Two Countries. Imagine, if you will, the checkpoint, the guards in their khakis and hats, their dull plastic buttons. Imagine the traveler. Perhaps it is you in the other life you always imagined, a grungy backpack and long hair, nothing but an itch to drag your boots on someone else's dust. Shake it all off. No shitty job, whiny kids, no nagging girlfriend hinting about diamonds and commitment, no envelopes with their hungry windows grinning your name. When the guard beckons, you show him your crisp blue passport. He calls you sir and stamps it without a thought. Freedom is a bridge, solid beneath your feet. It is the new country opening to you like a blank check. You grab it. You run. Imagine the other side, the throngs lined up since dawn, the women shushing kids who fidget in their best shirts, the men with earnest eyes. Let's make you one of them just for fun. You have a letter from a cousin saying, come, and your whole savings strapped to your stomach like a skin. You have nothing to declare, you tell the man scrutinizing your face overlaying the image onto the paper he holds up close to his face. You notice his veined white fingers, so different than your own stumpy and spider brown. You clutch the bright cloth bag holding all the reasons you are here, but small enough for the week-long trip the letter says you are taking. 
Your wife and children smile, unblinking in the Polaroid zipped into a pocket you hope won't be searched, lest you betray your grief. You kissed them, each one this morning, promised to write. But first, this. Answer the guards' questions steadily, as though nothing is at stake. Where you're headed when you cross that bridge, when you plan on coming back. This poem is um, it's called Variations in Blue. And it was written after a conversation I had with another poet, uh, Frank X. Walker, who is American from the South. And he mentioned uh, that he didn't know how to swim and I was pretty incredulous. Um, and then he said, well, there were no pools for Black folk when I was coming up. And I, it made me sort of just think about the difference in experience. And again, that's a lot about um, what Honeyfish thinks about, right? It's, it's a book that really thinks about what it means to take your body into a space, how that space has its own ideas, traditions, cultures, and histories, but you don't come as a blank check, right? So you bring your own body history, ideas, notions. Um, and you, so you're not a blank check, neither is a country, and there's always that encounter. So it's just a, really a book that thinks about all these ways that we encounter history, you know, worldviews, and ourselves in, in strange places. Um, so this is Variations in Blue after that encounter with Frank. In Sleep's 3D theater, home, a green island surrounded by the blue of ocean. Zoom to the heart, see the Kuva swimming pool filled with us, black children shrieking our joy in a haze of sun. Our lifeguard, Rodney, his skin flawless and gleaming, black as fresh oil, his strut along the pool's edge, his swoon-worthy smile. Daddy, a beach ball bellied Poseidon, droplets diamonding his afro, my brother hollering as he jumps into his bright blue fear, his return to air gasping and triumphant. And there, the girl I was, dumpling thick and sun brown, stripped down to the red two piece suit my mother had made by hand, afloat in the blue bed of water, the blue sky beaming above. When I wake up, I'm in America, where Dorothy Dandridge once emptied a pool with her pinky, and in Texas, a black girl's body draped in its hopeful, tasseled bikini struck earth instead of water, a policeman's blue-clad knees pinning her back, her indigo wail, a siren. I want this to be the dream, but I am awake, and in this place, where the only blue named home is a song, and we, we are meant to sink, to sputter, to drown. So of course, one of the big uh, encounters, confrontations, <laughs> um, learning opportunities of America was just the, the, the race relations, right, between uh, Trinidad is a small island of majority Black folks and certainly all people of color, Indian descent, etc. Um, and coming to America where the starkness of understanding what Blackness, that Blackness wasn't just a fact of life, but that it had all of these layers and meanings and connotations was certainly uh, something that I, I grew into over the many years that I've been here into learning the, the, the maneuvers of it all. Um, and so a lot of my poems also just think about um, Black life in America. And in particular, I feel in this moment, um, I have poems for many, for Tamir Rice and Trayvon Martin, um, Sandra Bland, and I'll just read a couple of those. Um, this one is called Play. And I want to say this, this is when I sort of started thinking, I need to stop watching these videos of Black Death, um, which really don't really do much right now for in America, besides I feel <clears throat> traumatized Black folks. Play, an elegy for Tamir Rice. I watched the video and wished I hadn't and knew I had to witness the boy being a boy before he becomes a corpse. 
and the moments brief as breath between his playing killer and dying, between his shooting the air and collapsing. Is that even the word for it? The startled descent of a child's bulleted body. I want to say, wait, but in the distance between the urge and the utterance, between lung and lip, one a thousand, two a thousand, he is gone. I play the video again and again, trying to hit stop in time to keep him alive. I make a black boy Lazarus of him, minus the miracle, the bullet faster than fingers or hope wins every time. This other poem is one I don't read too often, but it's an interesting hybrid because I think often of um, mothers in America, right? The, losing their, their, their children and the, the act of courage it takes to be a black parent in this country. Um, and at the same time, it's dedicated to Miss Linda, who is a, a, a figure in my village back home who also lost her son in um, pretty tragic circumstances um, that have nothing to do with police, police brutality, but those two things sort of collapsed into my mind. Again, that's what I mean about uh, encounter, right? Like the one thing calls for something else. So this is how to watch your son die for Miss Linda with an epigraph from Rachel McGibbons who writes, when the grief takes hold, you monster through it. Watch his skin become a coffin for his breath. Watch his bones rise like phantoms to haunt the twilight of his flesh. Beneath the bedsheet of his lids, see his eyes twitch, blind and wandering. If opened, they are the most beautiful glass. He will unremember time and laughter. His name will become a strange music in the foreign instrument of your voice. Watch him lose each human border, his tongue forsaking language, hands growing indifferent to reach or touch, his heart sputtering its final messages to yours. Watch as he breaks from himself and becomes a body so quietly, your tears thunder against his cheek. So in terms of that idea of sort of collapsing, I'm gonna read a poem that's not in Honeyfish. Like I couldn't, let me get some water. I couldn't get it together in time for it to be in the book. It's actually probably, the very first poem I wrote when I started thinking about Trayvon Martin, like back in 2012, 2013, and I've been, I literally finished this poem last year. Um, so that's how long it can take sometimes for the poem to happen. But it's called uh, For My Brothers. And there's a period there because again, you'll see a little bit of slippage there between um, when Trayvon Martin was murdered, it was again for, I think, America, a sort of um, catalytic case, right? But at the same time, I felt it really personally. I couldn't put my finger on why so personally. And then I realized that there was just something about the whole scenario that reminded me of my own brother, right? Um, and I think it was maybe one of those first moments of it where I felt like an after living as a black immigrant in America, I suddenly understood or felt what it might be like to be an African American. Cause any one of these murdered men could be your child, your brother. And I think that was maybe the moment that that really, really, really uh, came home to me. For my brothers. My brother was a dark, dark skinned boy with a sweet tooth, a smart mouth and a wicked thirst. At 17, when I left him for America, his voice was static with approaching adulthood. He ate everything in the house, grew what felt like an inch a day and wore his favorite shirt until mom disappeared it. Tonight, I'm grateful he slaked his thirst in another country. 
far from this place where a black boy's being calls like crosshairs to conscienceless men with guns and conviction. I remember my brother's ashy knees and legs, how many errands he ran on them, up and down roads belonging to no one and everyone. And I'm grateful he was a boy in a country of black boys. In the time of walks to the store on Auntie Marge's corner to buy contraband sweeties and sweet drinks with change snuck from mom's handbag or dad's wallet, and how that was a black boy's biggest transgression and so far from fatal, it feels an un-American dream. Tonight, I think of my brother as a black boy's lifeless body spins me into something like prayer, a keening for the boy who went down the road, then went down fighting, then went down dead. My brother was a boy in the time of fist fights he couldn't win and that couldn't stop him slinging his weapon tongue anyway, was a boy who went down fighting and got back up wearing his black eye like a trophy. My brother who got up, who grew up, who got to keep growing. Tonight, I am mourning the black boys who are not my brother and who are my brothers. I am mourning the boys who walk the wrong roads, which is any road in America. Tonight, I am mourning the death warrant hate has made of their skin, black and bursting with such ordinary hungers and thirsts, such abundant frailty, such constellations of possibility. Our boys who might become men if this world spared them, if it could see them whole, boys, men, brothers, human. Um, of course, the problem of, as we see most recently, um, of police brutality against black bodies isn't restricted to men, um, even though oftentimes we, you know, hold those men at the front of the movements for social justice and reform. But this poem is dedicated to Sandra Annette Bland, and it's called Heaven. Where does a black girl go when her body is emptied of her? And her wild voice, where does it sing its story when the knots of history make a grave of her throat? What of her future, blue broken, unmade, her name, say it, Sandra, unhoused, her dreams and memories lost to their source? Where does a black girl's love go when her heart is snapped shut like a cell door, the key out of reach as any justice. And what gift is lost when a black girl is made a body, her light dimmed into shadow, gone. How many angels weep when a black girl is torn into wings? So the next poem is a fun poem. It's not a fun poem, but it's fun for me to think about because it's one of those poems that emerged from a writing prompt. I love writing prompts. They are the best um, because, you know, there, there's the poems you think you want to write, the things you think you want to say, and then there are the things that happen because somebody asked you. So I was at a writing workshop and the facilitator gave us all these old textbooks from various completely non-English writing-y yeah. <laughs> disciplines. And we had to find a poem in there. I got Southworth, Southworth's Introduction to Modern Microscopy from 1975. And it was an engineering textbook about how the microscope was built and developed and the history of microscopy. So. This poem became a uh, dislocation and there's a slash. Um, if we were saying Trinidad vernacular, it's like this, this, you know, but dislocation. You are split into two parts, as in before and after. The camera itself and what lives on the other side caught in a plate glass gaze. You walk through so many 
chambers to find yourself detected, by which you mean your name is specimen, by which you mean your name is seen only under scrutiny. You deflect by any means observable. The resolution is sufficiently enhanced for the gaze to reach you even this far down the spectrometer. Look, you're crystal clear and fragile as a bulb, by which you mean sometimes you're only a projection, your own best trick of it. So thank you, Southward, right? Like that was, that happened. <laughs> Um, and it was quite the gift. Um, I like to think that, uh, you know, anti blackness is localized to America, but, you know, that's a falsity. It's, it's everywhere. We, it came with colonization, it keeps going. Um, and this poem, as uh, Boaz mentioned, I spent a year, uh, at, not a year, a few months, a semester, and then some at uh, the University of Leipzig in Germany as their Picador professor. And um, it's a funny story. I don't know if you knew Sebastian Boas, but we had met in um, at Cornell as well. And I was visiting and he was really anxious about if I'd left the office and I wouldn't, I was like, no, oh, I'm gonna walk home when I'm done. And he's like, mm, okay, so I'm gonna pick you up in a taxi. And I was just like, oh, why? He's like, well, I didn't want to tell you, but there's a neo-Nazi demonstration in the square. <laughs> And so you don't want to be walking home today. <laughs> and I was just like, oh my goodness. And so he comes to the university. I get into this taxi. He gets out because he's going to the counter protest, but he also thinks I shouldn't do that either. Um, and I was like, okay. And I'm like, oh God, what if this taxi driver's in here? Like, I don't know. I'm all like totally freaked out at this moment. And then the taxi inadvertently or whatever gets uh makes this route that ends us gets us stuck right in the middle of the demonstration so i'm sitting in this car with this bald german dude <laughs> watching other bald german dudes march and fly the flag and there's police everywhere and it's like totally terrifying and i get home and it was like such a beautiful day i was so excited to just walk home in the sunshine and this poem is one of those, I call them the gift poems, because I got home, I was like, thank you, God, I got here. I went upstairs, I sat down, I wrote this, and uh, I took out one word, and that's the only change I've ever made to it. So, self-portrait with neo-Nazi demonstration, Leipzig, Germany, April 20th, 2015. Just like that, the day is black and blue, bruised with hate. Just like that, my skin, black as fine leather, stretches so tight I might tear into bright black ribbons. See the flag, spent and flaccid, the windless black, red, and gold clutched in a fist that I fear will name my black face dirt and land. And so just like that, plans fade to black, a sunlit walk homes fold flat into a taxi's steel skin, the black seat holding my body upright. See the street draped in black uniforms, the shrill blue shout of sirens, the march of black draped demonstrators, faces set toward the sun in rows of black sunglasses. I want to shoot something to become a black grizzly and claw someone's throat. What I mean is I want to be black and brave, but today I am not just like that. So um, I have stuff, okay, still some time, keeping on the time, Boaz. Uh, a lot of this book takes place in Greece because I had the fortune of doing some travel there for writing. And again, that idea of encounter and familiarity and travel and what it means to take your body into these unknown spaces um, is part of what the book thinks about. And then um, this book, next poem is from a really sort of funny coincidence. So I'm in the hotel, you know, where we're staying. And I hear this loudspeaker of, I, I don't speak Greek, right? So I'm hearing this, just this Greek loudspeaker. And it's coming from the back of a pickup truck that I can't really 
seats in the distance. And back in my village at home in Trinidad, that happens when somebody dies. And so they get around on a pickup truck around the village with the, you know, the loudspeaker and they're like, so-and-so, son of so-and-so, daughter, you know, <laughs> father of, and it's like a whole obituary, but it's oral, you know, <laughs> and it's like died. And this is when the services and they'll go round and round saying it over and over and over again. So in my head, that's what this was. Turns out it was a guy selling towels to tourists, but oh, well, um, the poem was already happening. Questions from the rock in Plataea Gaia in Seraphos. Who will sing you, wandering one, island sprite? You have made no gardens, spun no cloth, made memories mere footprints instead of children. You have taken the faithless wind as your lover, called yourself daughter of the indifferent sea. Your childhood has wandered off untended, taking with it the faces that knew you. Who will know you now? Who will remember you to your innocence? You have gathered no bricks for building. You have let your tongue slacken, made no prayers to the gods. You pack your days with glitter and lie awake at night, evading dreams. When the sleep comes, as it will, who will travel the dirt roads shouting your name? Who will know your proper place and how to number you among your ancestors? Who will chant your passing until your spirit is safe across the stars drifting one? And will you rest? Um, this is another, another Greek poem. And I think this is one of the first ones where I finally figured out like, what I was doing with these poems. Um, I think it's the most overt. And when I was writing these in drafts, they were called portals. I'd have like portal and I kind of dropped that. But the idea of just like, I felt like, especially in Greece, I felt like I would walk into a room and just like my brain would be somewhere else. And that happens a lot in this particular poem as well. Well, arrival. So I want to get water. You look at the ocean. It's fathomless, blue, luminous. You look at the brown mountains rising like fresh bread, swollen with some livingness, ready to be bitten into. You are in Seraphos, and you are not in Seraphos. The blue of this water, its own, but calling from you so many other waters, Maracas, Bosphorus, the Gulf of Persia, all lapping at the shores of your memory. You have so many mountains inside you, they're your bread, the food of your soul. Seraphos is Seraphos and every island that has come before it. Seraphos is Seraphos and every wave of blue. How everything belongs to something else. Nothing untainted by memory or the experience of what has preceded it. How it is impossible to be just one thing in this world of so many entrances, so many openings falling into the other. A hibiscus blooms at the Benaki in Athens and another answers at the gates of the house your father was building in Trinidad in a small village surrounded by cane which is disappearing, eaten by cement and new roads. Even the ruins of the untilled land will soon be gone. Your father no longer lives in that house where the hibiscus has been replaced first by buttercups then ginger lilies, now topiary of green flowerless shrubs. But Greece calls it and it answers and is here. How we wait to be called suddenly without warning. What has been calling you here? To what are you the answer? Seraphos is answering the call of the disappeared in you calling the sugar and the waters of home, calling the longing for a place so simple you might remember who you are, the components of your being, the white house with the flat roof in a village so small you might forget it is where you spent your childhood. You remember yourself mostly as someone who left, who has forgotten the air gritted with the ash of cane fires, the house with no door and a leaky roof, but Seraphos asks you to remember. Seraphos demands with the dirt road that leads to your blue door, 
with the palm trees that brood in its heat, in the way you lift your face towards its holy sun, Seraphos calls you home. And I think I'll close um, with these last, I think I can, I think I can finish what I have. So Honeyfish, which is the title uh, poem is, uh, it's again, it's a fish that was, you'll hear about it. They would go catch it, cook it, we'd eat it. It was amazing. Um, I am like, what is this? And the fish was called Melanuri, which is this beautiful Greek word, but the actual fish in English is saddled bream. So I was never calling my poem that. Um, but Melanuri, when transliterated into English, is honeyed fish because of the color. It's this brownish color. So honey fish came out of that. And it first was the poem and then it became the book title. The catch is so fresh, each bite is blue. The sea still in it and settling on your tongue like prayer. This is what it means to eat, you think to abandon utensils for the grace of fingers, to hold flesh against flesh, hands slick with what will become inseparable from your own thrumming body. As a child, you loved fried dry, the small fish you ate whole and imagined them swimming in you, your belly full as an ocean. Now you know better that nothing consumed lives on as before. When the bone, thin as a wish, lodges itself in the pink flesh of your mouth, refuses offerings of bread or water, becomes an ache that will not be moved, you understand. This is what it means to be a body, that what is taken in takes root in ways beyond your choosing, a single bite, and you carry the ocean in your throat. Um, and I will close with this last poem, which is part of a duplex. I, I'm almost like I should end with Honeyfish, but I, I, I love this because of the, it's sort of a, it's just a, it's an uplift. I know I go down to the dark. I want to bring you back, right? And um, so I'm at the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown. I'm taking a workshop. Gabrielle Calvo Caressi, who is the bomb, says, you know, just walk out the classroom, see something, write something. And what I see is there's a fish on the roof across the way, but it's a weather vane, right? So it's in the sky flipping around. And I'm like, well, that's weird. Um, and so the first poem I wrote was an elegy, which I'm not going to read today, an elegy for the fish's weather vane. I'm like, you know, poor fishy, he's kind of stuck up there. But um, the fish was not going to let me end with pity. And so a few days later, I went back and wrote this poem, which is the ode to the fish as weather vane. You were built for a different blue, for oceans, rivers, clear complexes of glass, but here you are hoisted among the clouds, neighbor to the stars, your fins redefining wings. Say flight, say sky is ocean by another name. Say biology is one order of being, but imagination is another. How you undo cliche with your unlikely grace, slip through the clumsy nets, limits would knit around your bizarre existence, token they whisper, freak, but how you withstand the fickle transformations of weather, read the revolution wind scripts onto your body, learn to move in its midst, say evolve. Say, the first order of being is survival. Say, these gills will become lungs and testify. Say, thrive. Say, thrive. Say, thrive. Thrive in any element and name it possible. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. The, the, amazing, uh, so beautiful. I uh, like the poems are so amazing, and your reading of them is unbelievable. <laughs> so it's yeah, incredible, and uh, and and thank you. Yeah, uh, 
So I, I had a couple of questions, but here we go. You know, like we, we got uh, a few questions uh, already. So I'll, I'll start from the questions we got. And if you got more, do the Q&A. Uh, so I'm starting from Jasmine um, asking, do you have a favorite writing prompt or a writing prompt that has been incredibly generative? Uh, not yeah. always the same thing. Um, gosh, that's an interesting question. I, I, I peeked at it and I thought I was thinking about it. I love prompts in general, but I think to have a favorite prompt seems a little bit like a cheat because the point of the prompt is for me that it surprises me with the question it's asking. That said, um, I think that odes um, writing an ode, um, again, for me, you know, so the ode is a praise poem and I don't like easy things, right? So, so like, I don't want to praise ice cream because I just already love that. But I think there's always a challenge for me in, in praising the difficult. What is it? How can you, how can you mind past anger, confusion, all the things um, I have in difficult food. I have an ode to the belly because I, I made my students write odes to body parts, but you know, I told them write one to the part they couldn't stand so that they would learn to love it, you know, <laughs> or figure out a way to see what is praiseworthy, right? If anything, I mean, I don't know, not everything's redeemable, but I think the ode is a wonderful exercise in how would I praise this moment? How would I praise this object? How would I praise this thing? Um, even if it's not the other thing I do like um, is the, um, I guess this isn't a prompt, it's a little prompt. I have a series of poems and continue to write a series of poems in the voice of Gretel from Hansel and Gretel, um, which is a whole long story. And that's been incredibly generative. I've kind of been doing that since graduate school, <laughs> um, if not, yeah, with my friend, Kathy Chung, we write to each other back and forth in the voice of Gretel. And that's been incredibly generative. And the last thing I would say is ekphrastic poetry, writing uh, in relationship or in conversation with art. Um, always generative because there's just so many evocative pieces of art to write from. You can never get, you can never run out of things if you're writing in response to art. Thank you. So uh, another question came in. Uh, uh, thank you for reading the poetry tonight. Uh, it's beautiful, moving and powerful. Thank you. Yes, it is. <laughs> a question for the Q&A period. Some of your poems address deeply painful and awful moments from recent events. Can you talk a bit about how, for you, poetry arises from the pain of these horrific events? Are there times when the words come to you relatively easily, quickly, and other times when you find it takes longer to process, reflect, and recover? I feel like the answer is yes. <laughs> but um, I, I guess it's, it's a tricky thing, right, always, because um, there's on the one hand the impetus to document the moment to explore the moment and to write because that is what i can do i'm not a lawyer uh sorry mom uh you know who can can act so but i also feel like there's a way in which i want to be careful not to exploit black death for the purposes of my own poetry <laughs> right and so for me it's the the balance there becomes when I must write, um, like with that poem I read, the For My Brother's poem, which I feel like I wrote so many Trayvon Martin poems just because I was trying to figure out, uh, it, it was it was beyond just the headline, right? It wasn't, you know, I'm not out here being like, who, who they killed today so I can write this poem, right? Um, which I, I and, and it's, a, it's, you know, you get, there's a lot of conversation about this in the poetry world. Editors be like, do you have anything on insert, you know? And I was like, it's kind of gross. It's a little gross, right? Um, but at the same time, in a society where Black bodies and Black life is so marginalized, so disregarded, it, it's part of my work, I think, as a writer to, to document. It is part of my work to grieve. It's part of my work to stop and say something was taken from us. Uh, someone was taken from us. And and so, you know, sometimes I'm just pissed off. I have a lot of angry uh, poems. So I think the question becomes, what's the, what is the intersection of that moment that 
event and my moment <laughs> and the, my feeling in the moment, um, my experience, it's closeness or, or proximity or distance from me and my experience, et cetera. So there's no answer, right? It really is on a, it depends. It really depends. And so, and I'm generally a, a pretty slow writer. Like I might write something fast, but then I'm tweaking it for years. <laughs> so, um, so it, it, I think it just depends. It really does. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, so I was curious about your work with the Fewers uh, Flower Center. And yeah. You know, the intersection between activism and like making things kind of alive and engaged and like poetry, reading and art and, you know, all that great stuff that you're doing. It's one of the most important centers in the U.S., right, <laughs> for uh, African-American poetry. Uh, and like, you know, like, how does it work out, you know, like in the in the last yeah. And like, you know, like going back to its foundation, 2005 and going back, you know. And even before that, really. So there's the Fierce Wild Poetry Center, let me get the spiel, is the nation's first academic center dedicated to Black poetry. Um, and it was officially a center, JMU, to their credit, <laughs> right, chartered the center in 2005. But it actually began with my esteemed boss, Joanne Gabin, in 1994. How did Fierce Flower begin? It started as a conference. And it was a conference honoring Gwendolyn Brooks, who was the first African-American to win a Pulitzer, um, who was also a mentor of my boss, Joanne Gabin, uh, the director of the center. And um, Joanne tells the story really well about the fact that um, Gwendolyn Brooks did not have an MFA. And despite having won a Pulitzer, she could not get a, a job in academia. Right. Um, and that always so horrified her that she had sort of vowed anywhere she was, she would bring Brooks to speak, to talk, to lecture and like have students be exposed to her brilliance. And so that's what began. And so she was bringing her to JMU and she said, well, you know, she told another poet, I'm bringing and the po other poet was like, well, I want to come. And then the other one was like, I want to come. And then she's like, OK, so this is no longer a reading. This is something else. And so this the, the conference happened and it became the largest gathering of black poets people from you know all all walks of the poetry world gathered 1400 people here at jmu came to honor brooks but also for the first time to gather and see uh black poets in community with each other especially black poets who were not being given credit or due in the landscape of american poetry right except for like the two you know we love a token here's that one but here's this whole community that uh dr gavin brought together and so the center um so she did that in 1994 then she's like oh my god i'm gonna publish some stuff so came the first fierce flower um anthology they also video she had the foresight to videotape back in the day right <laughs> no no Zoom recordings, um, all of the panels and the readings. And so she did a video series that went all over the world and, and people were clearly hungry for this stuff. Um, and so then people were like, when are we doing that again? And she was like, uh, I thought I was gonna do it once, but okay. So 10 years later, 2004, um, she did it. And then it became a thing. So we are also the only place that has a decennial conference every 10 years on the four in September. Every Black poet knows to come to Harrisonburg, Virginia for a gathering that is um, academic, right? Thinking about how do we cr critically discuss Black poetry? What has been its trajectory over the 10 years since the previous conference? Um, but when the center became a center in 2005, I mean, everybody knows the conference, but we do a lot of other things. We have a reading series here at JMU. We have a children's creativity camp. We got to grow the poets, right? Grow the poets and poetry appreciators. We have a seminar, which is actually coming up this summer. Check out our webpage. There's so much information there um, where we honor one Black poet. And it's for teachers. It's helping teachers feel comfortable and empowered to teach Black poetry in their classroom. We focus on one poet. The poet's there. They hang out with the poet. This year we're doing it virtually, so it's like hang out on Zoom with the poet. 
Um, and develop curricula and all of that. We have a collegiate summit where we bring college students who sometimes might never work with a Black poet if they're just in school, right, um, in, in their various programs. So they come here and they have workshops with three or four faculty members. So we're busy always, all the time. We just published, oh, I don't have it close by, but it's back there, um, the third anthology um, in 2020. Um, that is Seeding the Future of African American Poetry, which came out of the third conference in 2014. Um, we have Facebook Live reading series. We're, we're busy. So we do a lot of stuff. And I guess in terms of that idea of the one, one premise of the center is uh, American Letters is incomplete without an accounting of African American and Black contributions to the literature, period, <laughs> right? The second also is that we have to nurture the poets and we also have to be stewards of that legacy so we're a, uh, we have the largest archive of black poetry in the country uh, video documents and we're working we just got a grant from the mellon foundation to keep doing that so that's very exciting um and you know, sort of so supporting the poets nurturing the poets um teaching um and also just understanding that um one of the things that is so powerful i think about black Poetry is that what it does is it's a record of Black life in America. And so it's always people are like, oh, it should be non political. Well, Black life is political and always has been. And so this work is a legacy of both Black people and an accounting of this country. And it tells, you know, Black joy is in there, Black struggle is in there, Black overcoming is in there. And so we get to, we're activists by default. <laughs> right so that's the center so you can check us out we're on social media facebook uh fierce flower poetry center you can find us jmu.edu slash fierce flower um we're on twitter sometimes um and uh instagram as well so you can learn more about our work and we have a program coming up on friday ancestors and inheritances legacies in black poetry and it's um uh, yeah find us yeah, uh, there is quite a bit of YouTube stuff <laughs> that mm -hmm. uh, I think you can watch and even support the center if you're interested somehow <laughs> to do that. It's you're so sweet. Yes, we would love you to support the center. <laughs> please do, please do. Um, so so just before we kind of uh, finish, uh, I was curious about kind of translations and mm -hmm. like different languages and travel and, you know, like how, how does it work out? So like when you go, home, whatever it is now, right. <laughs> can be, hello, uh, Lorenz, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I think it's kind of in different places and kind of different modes. And also you're such a fabulous reader. So like, you know, like, how does it kind of work out with the audiences and the, yeah. like, I mean, that's and, a great question because I think again, how the poem happens in place is really interesting, right? Like, I think one of the most interesting and powerful re readings I wrote about it in Honeyfish was when I was in Greece, I was on the island of Thassos and I was giving a reading there and um, they were like, well, we can read at the house in under the grape arbor or we can go out to the temple ruins. I'm like, oh my God, what life is this? So I go out to the temple ruins and I feel my body sort of just feeling so grounded in that moment. And it was like, it was a, it was a magical reading. It was a magical reading. And so the next day I went back to the ruins and um, it's a te former temple of the Gemini twins, uh, Felix and uh, pa uh, Pollux. And, um, and I'm a Gemini. <laughs> so I, I always felt like that was like, oh, that was my spot, right? You know, um, you know, or I go to Trinidad and, and I read, things about travel and somebody would be like, oh, you know, I never, I never think about what it must be like in this way to go, or I too sit in that visa line. Like, you know, one of the things I think that language, because we all share it does, is it gives us these points of connection and encounter, right? So an image might strike somebody who, you know, if nothing else in a poem speaks to them, they'd be like, oh, the hibiscus or whatever, right? So I think that, um, that, that, possibility of language it is the words but it's also everything the words conjure right and so there's so many points of entry 
whether we're in a different space or not. I mean, reading in Germany was in a whole, the customs of reading, right? <laughs> the Germans clap for a really long time, like an uncomfortably long time, but they're like, no, we're gonna let you know we enjoy this, you know? Um, it's just, I think it's, it's embodied, it's connective, it's connection. And I think that that opportunity is just, um, it's something that I think art, gives to us and that's why it's so important yay <laughs> <laughs> all right thank you thank you loren this was amazing uh thanks so much again for your time uh today and sharing with us your uh you know are we going to close out with interpretive dance or, or yeah. no yeah yeah <laughs> You see where I'm at? I, I can only do that now. <laughs> right? I know it's it's not it's not <laughs> 20, whatever that was. <laughs> Thank uh, you so, so much for having me. Oh yeah. Anytime. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much, everybody. Also, Peggy, for kind of facilitating this and making sure everything kind of worked out. And it did. And uh, this is wonderful. I wanted to mention just before we're leaving uh, that in June 15th, we're going to have another Friends event. Uh, we're going to have the uh, Alberto Manguel uh, talking about the Dictionary of Imaginary Places. Uh, and it's uh, connected to a library exhibit in the Lindemann. So join us. Uh, we have lots of good stuff coming. Uh, and uh, thank you so much, uh, everybody here to join us today. Have a wonderful evening and hope to see you in person or not uh, anytime soon. So uh, thank you and see you again soon. <laughs> Bye, thank you. Everyone.